Trick question. Huh? How many, how many physical resurrections are there in the Bible? That's why I warned you, trick question. You did, you caught it quick though. You, you, you thought, oh no, wait just a minute. Thirteen physical resurrections. And then there are two others that are titled uh, or depicted as resurrections. And um, so anyway... We'll call them resurrections as well. All right, Luke chapter number 8, verse number 41. And the scripture says, And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying, but as he went, the people thronged him. Now verse number 49. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only. And she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway. And he commanded to give her meat, and her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Who, who was in the nursery this morning? And Miss Brenda. So, Miss Brenda, I, I, for your sake, everybody else has got this information, but I'm going to put this up here real quick just for... Uh, there, there are 15 resurrections in the Bible, 13 physical bodily resurrections, two other resurrections, and it breaks up like this. There are three physical resurrections in the Old Testament. There are three uh, performed in Jesus' earthly ministry. Then, of course, there's His the Lord Jesus' resurrection. And then there are three other physical resurrections after Jesus' resurrection in that first century. Uh, and then there are three resurrections that are future, uh, yet to come. And then there are two resurrections that are not uh, physical or bodily. Uh, they're depicted as resurrections. So you have those. That's the breakup. So we come up with 15, the number of 15 resurrections found in Scripture. And so here we are at number five in Luke chapter number eight. Uh, this resurrection, second resurrection the Lord Jesus performed. And uh, we glean some truths from it. First of all, sickness and death is intended to drive us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like Jairus went to the Lord Jesus when he uh, was facing the death of his daughter. So you and I should be driven to the Lord Jesus. We should uh, be dr driven for comfort. We should be driven to him for hope. Driven to him for answers about our crises. We should be uh, uh, driven to him for mercy. That we might get our sins forgiven or, or whatever. But we should seek Him in uh, times of death and dying, just like Jairus did. But then in verse number 52, the Lord Jesus says this to, uh, to them. He says, weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And I thought when we're thinking about resurrection, death and resurrection and these matters... A good truth to draw from this text 
is that she is not soul sleeping. It's, Jesus says she's sleeping, but that sleeping is always referring to the body only. Anytime you find that term, it's the body only. Uh, she is not totally unconscious. She's not in an a, a, a unconscious state for a period of time until the body is resurrected again. We know that is not the case. Uh, so sleep, get that. Sleep in the New Testament when it refers to death is always and only referring to the body. Okay? Uh, the soul is still very much alive. Miss Judy was just talking about how that Elijah, that he came back on the Mount of Transfiguration. There was the Lord Jesus during his earthly ministry. And we're told that Moses and Elijah both came and talked with Jesus. And Moses' body, I don't know where it's at, but he died. And Elijah, uh, we know that Elijah did not. He was taken up in a whirlwind. But still, you, you, you have someone who is, one who, of them has died thousands of years ago. And now, they're visibly talking with the Son of God. There's no soul sleep. We read, listen to the passage in Luke chapter 16, uh, verse number uh, 22. You know the story about the rich man and Lazarus. And Jesus told about it, and he said this, verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abram's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. The rich man died, his body is buried on earth. And it says, in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip his... And so on. And so what's he doing? He's talking to him. He's talking to Abraham. He's communicating. He's not unconscious. His body's dead on the earth, but he's still existing. Like we talked about this morning, the definition for resurrection has to do with the soul coming back into the body. What we have is at death, the, the soul leaving the body. You, you say, well, what's your soul? It's you. Your body's just your house, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so, uh, there are other passages. The thief on the cross, Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. His body crucified, but he will be uh, uh, his soul is in heaven. So the body is one of these days going to awake, but in that intermediate period, when Jesus says sleep, don't adopt what the Jehovah's Witnesses' doctrines teach. Don't adopt what the seven-day Adventists teach. They all teach that there's a soul sleep. And it's not biblically accurate. It's not true. Resurrection number six. The raising of Lazarus in John chapter number 11. Lazarus... He dies, friends of the Son of God. Shortest verse in your Bible is found there, or at least in our English Bible, is found there in that chapter. Anybody know what that shortest verse is? Jesus wept. Two truths I draw from this resurrection. <clears throat> this resurrection demonstrates that Jesus is who he has been claiming to be because the Bible said there's a bunch of folks that believed on him. Uh, because of it. But then also the resurrection <clears throat> delivers Lazarus from corruption. He's delivered from corruption. Look at these verses here. It's verse number 39 and 43 and 44. Look at these verses in the 11th chapter. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh four days. And so they didn't have embalming practices like we've got. So the body is drawing flies. It is corrupting. It is stinking. For he's been dead for four days, we're told. Now verse 43, And when he thus had spoken, 
Jesus, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about him with napkins. And then Jesus said to him, Loose him and let him go. You do know that the, that the uh, Lazarus is corrupt. And, and yet the Lord is going to take all of that corruption away from him. Uh, that, that's going to be the case with you and I. You know the Bible says in the book of Philippians that we have vile bodies. We do. We have bodies that are corrupting. We, have, we are under a curse. We are in a corrupt... The Bible says in Romans 8 that we're awaiting the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. Now the body's been paid for and already bought. The Lord owns it. But one of these days it's going to get fixed. And that which he's purchased is going to be completed and fixed and transformed. And so that's the truth that I find in this John 11 passage. That the Lord delivered him from his stink, I guess you would say. It won't have body odor up there in heaven, Aaron. Don't have to have body odor, you know. I mean, the Lord's going to fix all that. Everything's going to be fragrant and, and fun and, and fixed one of these days when we get to heaven. Seven, number seven. Jesus' resurrection. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered unto you that gospel. Jesus died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. He's up from the grave, isn't he? He's up from the grave. That Romans 1 says it's proof that he is the Son of God. His resurrection proves that he's the Son of God and that he's God the Son. Because he says in the Gospel of John that he raised himself. Nobody's going to take it. He said, I'll lay it down and I'll take it up again. He's the one who raised himself. He was seen of over 500 at one time, 1 Corinthians 15. And they saw him then not only for 40 days after the res resurrection, but they also saw him ascend back to heaven. And the resurrection is necessary tonight. It's necessary to fulfill the scriptures. Luke 24 says that it's written that Christ must die, be buried, raised the third day, and repentance and remission of sins is to be preached among all nations. And so it's to fulfill scripture. It's written. It's already pre-written, and you, he's just fulfilling scripture. The resurrection is necessary to forgive sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, And if Christ be not raised, ye are yet in your sins. Your sins aren't forgiven if, if Jesus isn't up from the grave. And the reason that you can be forgiven is because he's up from the grave. He's resurrected. He, uh, the resurrection is necessary to justify us in his sight. Romans 4.25, Romans 8.34, the Bible says he's raised again for our justification. So we can be justified in the sight of God. And then Romans uh, 8, 34, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. If God's already declared you just in his sight, then if everybody else in the world condemns you, the most important has not condemned you. He's forgiven you. And cleared you of all charges, we're told, because of the Son of God. And then the resurrection is necessary to impart the Holy Spirit to us. John 20, 22, he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's what he did when, after his resurrection, one of the first events is he's breathing on the disciples. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And so uh, we get the Spirit of God uh, imparted to us. And then the Bible talks about us... Uh, having the new birth because of the resurrection. 1 Peter 1 and 3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, it's because He's resurrected. He's raised from the dead. The Son of God is raised from the dead that I can be begotten again. I can be born again. I can be birthed into the family of God. <clears throat> so, number eight. Are we making good ground? We're moving right on. We only got 15. <laughs> we're over the halfway mark. Well, no, we're at the halfway. No, we're not there. 
There are three. Uh, there are three more resurrections after Jesus' resurrection uh, that that we see here in that first century. There's the raising of many saints. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse number 52 and 53. Listen to these verses. Peculiar, very peculiar passage. It says, verse 52 and 53 of the 27th of Matthew. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And came out of the graves... After his resurrection, after Jesus' resurrection. And went into the holy city in Jerusalem. And appeared unto many. The raising of many saints is the eighth resurrection in scripture. We do not know whether these saints died long ago or more recent. We don't know. We don't know. I can infer and give all kinds of opinion. We do not know if they remained alive or died again. I could give an opinion. We do not know if it was permanent resurrection. We do not know who they saw in Jerusalem. We do not know why they went to Jerusalem. We do not know what they said to people that they saw. We don't know any of that. But we do know that it's true. It's a true historical event. Saints arose after Jesus resurrected. During that same time period. Saints. The Bible talks in 1 Corinthians 15 about this Jesus' first resurrection as first fruits. The first fruits. First fruits are first pickings uh, in biblical language. And so, uh, that is the promise of future harvest and future pickings. So, it could be that just the, there, this is just the first fruit pickings in there at, at, of Old Testament saints or something. And, and I, I don't know. But they're first saints that are resurrected. They were saints. Set apart ones. Saints, hagios. It, that is uh, redeemed people. Now, there is a problem. A lot of people have a Roman Catholic idea about saints. And the Roman Catholic idea about saints is uh, you become a saint by works that you do. Right? And then the way they, the way they work it is then uh, they wait till after you've died. And then after you die, then they will uh, bring you before a man-made council. And the man-made council will determine whether you qualify. Let me use some modern language. Not. It's not that's not how it operates. You're not saved that way. You become a saint when you receive the free gift of God's grace. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And men are not judging it and evaluating. And it's certainly not by works. So, if you're saved, you can just re uh, replace the word saved with the word saint. Saint Kurt. <laughs> saint Kenny. Saint Tom. You know what I'm only naming the men. <laughs> St. Linda, yeah, you would notice. If you're saved, you're saints. You're a saint. What about that? They were saved. And then they were set upright. Verse 52 
Look at what the passage says. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. They're brought back to life. Physical life. Um, transformative uh, work has been, uh, has occurred in them. You, 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 I'd have been mad if I was the Lord. What, I, if I was with the Lord, and I'm at, not the Lord, but if, if I were with one of the saints, I'd be mad. Can you imagine having already gone to heaven and then one day the Father says, I need you back down there. <laughs> uh, I want you to get back in that body and we're, we're going to take a lap over in Jerusalem. And I don't know whether they died again or not. I don't know. Uh, well, how soon they died, I'm saying. I don't know. But I'd have balked. I'd have said, no, we wouldn't have balked. Because we, we, we're, uh, we're already in perfect submission by the time we get to heaven. But you get my point. Going back? Are you kidding me? Going back? Number nine. That my daughter... It's gonna, you do know that uh, Joanna's going to have a baby? Does everybody know that already? She mentioned naming the baby Dorcas. Acts chapter 9. If you're, named, if you're named Dorcas, don't get mad at me. Get mad at your parents. Acts chapter 9. <laughs> Acts 9, 36. Can you imagine having to live with that? Woo, he had to be dorky. Acts 9, verse 36. We're going to rename Gavin Dorcas. He's for it. Thumbs up. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha. Let's call her Tabitha. Which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good deeds and alms deeds, which she did. came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. As, and for as much as Lydda was uh, nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter rose and went with them, when he was come, they brought him unto the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, and kneeled down, and prayed. And turning him to the, uh, the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa, so on and so forth. What, what do we have here? The, the truth that I glean from it is that we have the uh, signs of the apostles. That is a New Testament terminology you understand. The signs of the apostles, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. You have Simon Peter praying over this child of God. And she comes back to life. Raised from the dead. The next one that we'll see is going to be Paul. He's going to do the same with Eutychus, who fell out the window and died. All of that proves the, the message that they're proclaiming. It's a sign, gift, that was given to the apostles. A sign, gift. The book of Acts is a transitional book. And so you are moving away from Old Testament to New Testament. You are, God is finished with the temple. And now he's going to the church. He is finished with Old Testament doctrine.
doctrines. Many Old Testament, and now he's going to New Testament teachings. He is moving from Old Testament sacrifices to uh, the supreme sacrifice who has come, the Lord Jesus. And so, during that period, can you imagine? Can you imagine? You have been taught uh, Levitical law all of your life. And God gave it to the nation of Israel. And now all of a sudden, here are these whippersnappers who've come along and they're proclaiming that is no longer what we're going by. Things are different. There's been a change here. We're not going to the temple anymore. We're not doing the feast of Passover annually and offering up the lamb. That's not what we're about anymore. And so they come with this message and the Jewish year automatically turns them off as heretics. Saul of Tarsus declared all of them heretics. And so you do have the Lord, the need for the Lord to do something to prove that what they're saying is right. And so what's he do? He, through the hands of the apostles, did signs and wonders and miracles because we're in this transitional period. And then you'll find out that later on, Paul, there is a dis diminishing. When the word of God's given, the New Testament revelation is given. Later on, you have the Apostle Paul leaving his co-worker, uh, Trophimus, sick. Back down at, what is, it, what is it, Philetus or whatever it is. He, he leaves him, you know what that means? That means Paul couldn't heal him. And here's one who has that, had that capacity for a period of time. But you know what's happening? There's a decrease of signs and miracles. And until the word of God has come, until the word of God has come, and once the message is confirmed, then there's no longer the need after decades of confirmation that this is God's book and there's no longer need. For signs, miracles, and wonders to confirm it all. So that's the truth I catch from these book of Acts resurrections. Otherwise, if you've got the gift, get at it. Get down to the morgue and let's go. Let's get on with the program. Get get right. Get to the hospitals. Let's have hospital ministry and just so whoever's got the gift, get down there to the hospital. And get everybody fixed. That's not what the Lord's about. It's clear. That's what TV preachers will tell you, but that they don't practice it. They just try to preach it to you so they can get money out of you. New revelation is coming and God is confirming it with these raising people from the dead with the apostles' prayers and their hands touching them. Hebrews 2, verse 3 and 4. Listen to these. This uh, Hebrews 2, 3 and 4 says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall, uh, what I say, verse 3 and 4, how shall we escape when we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, it was confirmed. You know how it was confirmed? Jesus also did signs, wonders, and miracles. Didn't he? Confirming what he said. Something new's on the scene. And there's this definite confirmation. Verse 4. God also bearing them witness, the apostles, both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost 
according to his will. He, he's confirming them. He's affirming. He's confirming that uh, their message is truth. Raising of Dorcas. Acts chapter 20. Verse 7 through 12. The raising of Eutychus. I love Eutychus. Don't you love Eutychus? I love the story about Eutychus. It, it, you know why I like the story about Eutychus? The apostle Paul preached till midnight. Preached till midnight. I love it. I couldn't even take it. What am I talking about? Preached till midnight. And there, there, there's this young man. He's up in the window. Out in the third loft. Third story. Building. That's a pretty good fall. I don't know how eight foot ceilings. I don't know. But 20 feet up in there. Here he is. He's sitting in the window. And he gets sleepy. Right? And he falls out. They dash down, the Apostle Paul and the others dash down. And the Apostle Paul goes down there and prays over it. And the boy comes to life again. He didn't, he didn't just have the wind knocked out of him. He's dead. And he was resurrected. But here's the part I like. They come back in the building. They preached till morning. He gave a little homily. That's the word from which we get teach in that passage, Ken, is the word from which we get the word uh, homiletic or homily. <laughs> so he, he's teaching. The Apostle Paul is after the resurrection of Eutychus. What power of God I see here. I thought about how the Lord can restore our falls. He can. I thought about the danger of uh, being... Just half-hearted. It's a great picture. The boy is up there in the third loft. The young man is. Paul's preaching. And he just keeps on going. And he says something like, All right, we got 15 points on resurrections today. Or something, you know. And there he is sitting in the window. Window open. And he's getting a little tired. Which is common. Felon can only take so much. Right, Ken? Yeah. You didn't fall asleep this week in meeting, did you? Wonder you didn't. You just, it gets long. And all of a sudden, the boy, you know what deal is? He's not in and he's not out. Right? He's a picture of those who aren't in and aren't, aren't all the way out. They're not all the way in, they're not all the way out. Half heartedness, and it's dangerous for us to be half hearted. Isn't it? Half-hearted about church. Half-hearted about worship. Half-hearted about tithing. Half-hearted about living right. Half-hearted about praying. Half-hearted about studying your Bible and reading your Bible. Half-hearted about telling the gospel. The Lord wants us to be all in. Because it's dangerous to just be half. All right, that's ten. That was the raising of Eutychus. We only got five more. Can you hang on? We got 15 minutes before it's 8 o'clock. I bet we can too. So I guess we'll go over a little bit, won't we, Gav? Possibly. Oh, yeah, it's 7 o'clock. <laughs> All right, we've got ten. We've got five more resurrections. Three more physical resurrections and two others. For number 11, quit distracting me. We've got to go. The raising of the saved. There's the raising of the saved. The bodies of the saved will be resurrected and reunited with their soul one of these days. There's going to be a resurrection. Uh, the Old Testament is uh, clear about the fact of the resurrection. But the Old Testament is not so clear about the time of the resurrections. Uh, when you read the Old Testament, 
on this subject, you'd think that all are resurrected at the same time. Right? Can't like the all-millennials believe. They believe in a general resurrection. You get out there in those mountains. You get out in the mountains in the east, the southeast. There are so many general resurrectioners that it isn't even funny. They, they just believe. Everybody's coming up at the same time. And they have some Bible to try to verify their position. You know why? Because there are passages in the Old Testament that seems to teach that that's how it's going to operate. And there's a passage in the New Testament that teaches that seems to teach that that's how it's going to operate. Uh, look, look, look at a couple of passages with me. Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 2 and 3. And many of them that slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Right? There, there's good, it, so it's, it seems like it's a, a general resurrection. Just all, everybody's going to happen at the same time. Uh, John chapter 5, verse number 28. And 29 says, uh, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And if you take that passage, you could say, oh, it would seem like it's all going to happen at the same time, Right? But you study the Old Testament and you'll find out that you can read one verse and one verse is 2,000 different years different than the, than the rest of the verse. The first part of the verse is 2,000 different than the first part of the verse. You follow me? Am I confusing you yet? I'm sorry. Uh, but there's a general, like everybody's going to happen at the same time. And that is not true. In, like Revelation chapter number 20 tells us that there's going to be two resurrections. Revelation 20 gives us two resurrections. And those two resurrections are a thousand years apart. Uh, thank you, Ken. I wasn't sure anybody agreed with me yet. They're a thousand years apart. There's going to be the first resurrection. And the rest of them weren't alive Till after the thousand years. And so there's going to be another resurrection. Call it a second resurrection or whatever you will. The key passage, look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. A key passage, I think, a key passage to understanding God's resurrection program is found there in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 through 24. Look, listen to these verses. It says, uh, but now... Is Christ risen from the dead, verse 20, and become the first fruits of them that slept. He's become the first fruits. He's called the first fruits, Jesus, when he resurrected, right? Thank you, Larry. Verse 21. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, <clears throat> which is true, and so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, and I think that's significant. All of these resurrections are going to be in their order. There's an order to it. God has an, an order in his resurrection program. Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming... And then 24 goes on and says, then cometh the end. And I see there the possibility for three groupings of resurrection. Three groupings of resurrection. First fruits, Christ, and I would suggest some others also, like Matthew 27 talked about in that first resurrection. 2,000 years ago. Afterward, they that are Christ at His coming. And that is resurrections at Jesus' is coming. You do know that there's resurrection of, uh, at, at Jesus' is coming. Resurrection of believers. We're, I, and I would point that at His coming would include rapture and revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Christ seven years apart, but all in that end time, Christ coming time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 said that the saints are going to be caught up in the air. 1 Corinthians 15 says, in the moment in the twinkling of an eye will be changed. Some will sleep. Some aren't even going to sleep. Some are just going to be alive and poof, gone. But some are going to be in the grave and come up from the grave. Right? And then you say, well, why in the world don't you just put it all at the end of when Christ comes? Because the Bible says that believers are coming back with Him when He returns. So we must have already gone up. And then I do understand that there, there's a description of tribulation saints who will be resurrected at when Christ comes. Revelation chapter 20. It's called the first resurrection. They're beheaded for Christ. And in that crowd might be whoever, whoever, tribulation saints, it might be other saints. I don't know exactly all of it. I, it during that seven-year period, all I know is there are people come up. Somebody says, well, that's when the Old Testament saints come up. I don't know. And I'm not sure any of us do. All I know is that, let me put it this way, we'll not fall out about any of this Somebody said, well, there's a mid-tribulation rapture. I don't believe in the rapture or whatever. Listen, you just do whatever you want. Study your Bible. Find out for yourself. But there's only seven years difference between us. And you know what? It doesn't make a lick of difference. I'm, one of these days, I'm coming up from the dead. And one of these days, I'm coming back with Christ. And one of these days I'm going to be on this earth rejuvenated, changed. I'll be like the Son of God. Like Him in a glorified body. Jesus is the first fruits of a fruit of bodies that have never been before. You're talking about a different kind of body. It's described as a glorified body. It's described as uh, uh, absolutely, uh, what, what, what are the terminologies in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Somebody help me. No, don't help me. Celestial body. Spiritual body. It's called a body that, I don't know, I can't figure it out. Just walk through walls, don't need doors. You know, uh, never get sick. It, it is never a drag on your spiritual person. All, all of those things. Happy day, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away, so one of these days I can get fixed. Fully fixed. One of these days we're getting fully fixed. There's a raising of the saved. So, you say, well, what the Bible says is that it's the first resurrection in Revelation chapter 20. The first resurrection. Well, I, I think the first resurrection is just the, a first, the same type of resurrection. Uh, whether, whether it's the resurrection of those in Matthew 27 or whether it was the resurrection of, at the rapture or whether it's the resurrection of the tribulation saints, it's all the same type of resurrection. It's the first kind of resurrection. It is a body like the Lord Jesus, glorified. It is a category. It says some are going to be raised to li resurrected to life. Some will be resurrected to damnation. It, this is the resurrection to life bunch. So, then that last crowd will be those who are resurrected, resurrection of damnation, as Scripture says, the, the unjust. There will be resurrection of the just and the unjust. Acts 24, 15, John 5, 28, 29. All right, we're to 12. Don't look at your watch. The raising of the unsaved. Daniel 12, 2 said that they're going to be raised to shame. An everlasting contempt. Acts 24, 15 calls it the resurrection of the unjust. I've heard people say that they're not going to be resurrected. Well, what are you going to do with these passages? They're not going to be bodily resurrected. Yeah, they are. It's not a body like the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's some kind of resurrection body. 
And Revelation 20 describes what that will entail, verse number 11 and following. Listen to it. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. They've been resurrected. And the, this is the resurrection of the unjust. This is the resurrection to damnation. Like these passages talk about. And they'll stand before God, raised to stand before the judge of the universe. Court is in session. The majestic holiness of the judge will create fear and trembling. And the unsaved will be judged by that which God has recorded about them and about their lives and deeds. It says in verse number 12, And I saw the dead, uh, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Salvation is never determined by works. But judgment is always determined by works. It is. Judged by what you do and don't do. And the seed gave up, gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's called the second death. That's not annihilation now. And the reason I know that, Matthew 25, 46 says that these shall go away into everlasting punishment. And that word everlasting is the same word that's used in the same verse describing the saved as having eternal life. Eternal and everlasting, same Greek word. So whatever it is for the child of God in heaven is going to be the same for those that are in the lake of fire. Time, duration. You say, well, you're dying means you're, you're done with. No, it doesn't. I've already talked about that. It doesn't. Death in the scriptures, talking about separ is, is use, separation is involved. Spiritual death, you're separated. The, your, uh, physical death, the body and the soul are separated. Spiritual death, the soul is separated from God. Second death, the soul is separated from God forever. Are you all right? I know we're trying to say too much, too quick, too all that. For a slow brain, it's hard to work, but we're working it. 13. Ready? The raising of the unsaved. Number 13. The raising of the two prophets in the tribulation. Look at Revelation chapter 11. There are two prophets during the tribulation period, the great tribulation period, those seven years preceding the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And we're told there about them, they'll preach for 1,260 days, 30-day months, Jewish calendar, 30 days, 42 months, three and a half years. They will preach for three and a half years of that period. They're going to predict coming judgment. They will be clothed in sackcloth, and sp which speaks of mourning and the need for repentance. That's their message. We better, we better do serious business with God, is the message. Look at verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. They're, they're lights in that dark age. 
Just like we're to be light in this dark age. It's going to get darker. We think it's dark. It's going to be dark, really dark in those days. Verse 5, they have supernatural protection. It says, and if any man will hurt them, they'll need supernatural protection because people will hate them. They'll hate their message. It says, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven. Now they're identified. Power to shut heaven. Who in the Old Testament had power to shut heaven? Yes, Elijah. That it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who had uh, ability to turn water to blood and smite the earth with plagues? Moses. They're not named. But there is a description. You say, well, is it, is it actually Elijah and Moses? I think it is. But if not, then they're Elijah and Moses-like. Aren't they? Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, whenever God said, all right, that's all I want you to say, that's enough. The beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. They're killed by the permission of their Lord. Right? Verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem is what it is. Their bodies shall lie in the streets. They didn't even give them a grave. Didn't even put them away. Didn't even hide them. Global cameras are going to be on the spot. The TV set's going to be all about, look at those guys that bad mouth our systems <laughs> and our souls and our sins. You're fine unless you mention sin. God's people are doing just fine until they mention sin. And the need to repent of sin to get right with God. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. For three and a half days they're going to be on televised. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. Shall send gifts one to another. It's going to be a birthday party. It's Christmas time. <laughs> They're going to turn it into another Christmas. Let's have another celebration. These jokers are gone. Thank God. What a thorn in the side they were to us. That's the way the world is going to think. About God's messengers. In that tribulation period. Because these two prophets. What did they do? Tormented them that dwell on the earth. They, they counted this torment. All oh, the preacher preaching just torments of fire out of me. Well, you better check out what crowd you're with. <laughs> Verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. Uh, that would have been a nice television slot. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them and they're scared to death and they heard a great voice from heaven saying come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them and the same hour was there a great earthquake and the ten part of the city fell and in the earthquake there was men were slain of men seven thousand in this earth massive earthquake the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God in heaven I'd have been spooked too, wouldn't you? Here we are, we're cackling and laughing and mocking and ah, stupid old fogey Christianity. What in the world? Dumb prophets. They, they're just ignorant. They should have known they couldn't survive our system. 
And all of a sudden, boom! They were up walking around after three and a half days. And all of a sudden, a voice, come hither, come up hither. And they ascend. And I'm sure it was slow enough like the Lord Jesus did. Slow enough so that all the enemies can just watch it. The cameras are, are Johnny on the spot. You know they are. They always are. But they weren't planning on this. There'll be enough. There's so many cell phones. They'll catch it. Won't they? Somebody will catch it. We have live footage. And then an earthquake. And 7,000 are dead because of it. That's quite a resurrection. Those who unjustly mistreat God's people will one day see. Here's the tragedy. They'll one day see that God's faithful children were right and they were wrong. As right as they think they are. As convinced that they're right as they are. One of these days they'll find out differently. Won't they? There are the 13 bodily resurrections. Two more quickly. And I'll, I'll not take much time with them. I'll, I'll not go there. Uh, the raising of the nation of Israel is described as a resurrection in Ezekiel chapter number 37. Ezekiel 37 they're raised from the dead. Maybe I ought to read a verse or two there. Ezekiel 37. It says uh, that the hand, you, you remember the valley of dry bones, right? It says, And the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, uh, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin, put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied and was commanded as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone, and when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skins covered them above but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, Prophesy, uh, Son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds of the breath, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Thus he said unto me, Son of man, These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. What do we have here? The people of Israel were dispersed, right? It's, it's called the diaspora. It, they uh, were uh, dispersed early the Assyrians overpowered them. Babylon, northern kingdom, southern kingdom overpowered them. And they were then buried 
among the Gentiles. A.D. 70, Jerusalem destroyed, dispersed among the nations. Israel. But there's going to be a resurrection. Romans 11 says, when the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, then all Israel shall be saved. Let me say, in um, uh, May 14th, 1948, there was the establishment of the Jewish state in the 20th century. In our lifetime, some of our lifetimes, uh, it, it, it was established. Uh, and that is just a national uh, resurrection has taken place. Not spiritual. They have no spiritual resurrection yet. But you know what? They're going to. During that great trip time, there's going to be multitudes of Jews born into the family of God and believe on the true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to be saved. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's also the time of Jacob's conversion. Romans chapter number 11. So there's going to be national resurrection. The nation's going to be resurrected. It's already resurrected to some degree. But the bulk of the fulfillment, if you read the rest of chapter 37, is in the millennium. And, it's, and it talks about all the stuff and the word of the Lord came. We, we, we don't have time to talk about it all. But the idea is that there's going to be no more idols in the land. And uh, that uh, uh, they're going to dwell in the land that I've given unto Jacob my servant. And they shall have children. I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It's an everlasting covenant. I'll multiply them. I'll set my sanctuary in the midst of them and so on. And uh, the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. And there's coming a millennial blessing. And Israel as a nation is going to be directly blessed and resurrected. Fact of the matter, he says, the chapter says that David's going to rule. Well, what are you talking about, Ezekiel? David's long gone. Oh no, there's the descendant of David. Who's going to sit on the throne of David. And his name is Jesus Christ the Lord. And rule and reign out of Jerusalem. So there's going to be a national resurrection. It's a, it's a resurrection. Depicted as a resurrection. Isn't it? 15. The final is the raising of those who are spiritually dead it's not a physical resurrection but is it is a spiritual resurrection there is a resurrecting of those who are dead in trespasses and sin Ephesians 2 1 and you hath he quickened made alive who are dead in trespasses and sin John 5 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, the Father, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And that life is not future out there. That word uh, half is present. It's a present possession. You don't have to wait till you die to get it. It's a, it says he hath everlasting life. Hath. The word is past. That word past, Zodiades uh, points out that it's a perfect tense, which means he, he defines it. He said it, it describes an action that took place in the past that, res, that is uh, the result of which have continued into the present. Something that's happened in the past, the result is into the present. He hath. Something's happened. And now you've got everlasting life. And it's not after death. It's now. In this life. You get the life of God. Birthed into your soul. 
and you were dead to God previously, dead to God. Now you've come alive. That's the new birth. That's spiritual resurrection. Uh, Colossians 3 says, If ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. You say, well, I was resurrected whenever Jesus... Re Maybe that's what the pastor talking about. It might be talking about that just whenever you got saved. You were raised with Christ. Raised up. New life. Spiritually resurrected. Who has this life? It says those who hear and believe. Those who hear the gospel and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They are saved. As in the promise is they shall not come into condemnation you know there's no condemnation for the believer you know why because all of it fell on a substitute and his name is Jesus Christ the Lord all of it fell on him at Calvary so now there's none for me I'm glad God's plan worked it just like that. Let's stand. Linda Paul is playing. What about your heart tonight? You say, well, long-winded preaching. Didn't go till midnight, did we? It's good for us to... Fill our minds with the Word of God. Good bit of reading of Scripture, but that's it's good for our minds. It's good for us. It's good for you to know that I'm not just coming up with ideas on my own, but it's coming from Scripture. We are Bible people. The pastor's not the authority. The Word of God's the authority.